السلام عليكم everyone. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of Sharq, uh, we would like to welcome you and welcome Omar and thank you all for coming. I'll uh, just uh, give a quick bio about the speaker. Omar Salha is uh, the founder and the uh, chief executive of uh, Ramadan, <coughs> Ramadan 10 project. Ramadan 10 project is basically a project that based in London about uh, the idea of togetherness and inclusiveness. Uh, they have done multiple uh, events and the flagships uh, open iftar, Ramadan, Pavilion, and the collection of Islamic art as culture and heritage events. Omar is academical and a lecturer, uh, and he in international diplomacy and soft power. He was awarded the PhD in Nohud Scholarship at Swas. He uh, in, in integration of Muslims in the British society. Omar has published and write research at, uh, and a fellow at the UC Berkeley, California. Omar has held multiple awards. Uh, one of them is the Halal uh, Trips, 40 Most Inspiring Influential Muslims in the Most uh, Advocate category. And uh, the Points of Light Award by the, uh, the government of the United Kingdom. Um, as well as Omar is in the advisory board of the Mayor of London, the annual Eid in the Square, and a fellow at the Royal Society of Art. Inshallah, we're going to talk about wisdom and soft power, solving global challenges through social and cultural entrepreneurship. Uh, the mic is yours, Omar. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala sinabina Muhammad wa ala ali ashabi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everyone doing? Good? Long day? Everyone seems tired and head down. Khair, inshallah. I want to I wanna keep this uh, uh, conversation as much as possible. And um, thank you, Ahmed, for the kind introduction and to the Sharq team for hosting, Muhannad and everyone. Really appreciate it. It's great to be back, actually. For those who don't remember, last year I had longer hair, I had to cut it off. Um, but uh, I suppose I can begin by saying if you haven't already registered for the course, International Diplomacy and Soft Power. It is live on the Sharq platform. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you taking it uh, because it will be really useful and beneficial um, as a follow on from today's discussion. So we'll be talking a lot more theory, a lot more case studies on the course. Um, and let, let us know your feedback as well, inshallah, uh, because I think it will be great to do some more specialized courses as well in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, all the best with the team. I know you guys are going to be busy for the next few months for the, for the conference coming up, which uh, uh, looking forward to. So today's topic uh, is looking at wisdom, soft power, and solving global challenges through social and cultural entrepreneurship. Now, uh, first of all, we need to begin by understanding that the world is very, very complex. There isn't one solution for everything. Is that true? We, we believe that? Yeah, you agree? OK. Uh, what if I told you there is actually one solution for everything in the world? What would you say to that? Which, how many of you here, by show of hands, would agree with that statement, that there is one solution uh, to all of the world's problems? One person only. Two people. Oh, okay, yeah, I should do well, You can ask. <laughs> ask how, many, how many people here believe that there should be multiple solutions for the challenges we face in the world? Okay, all right, fine, uh, noted. So the two who put their hands up, I know who you are. Okay, I'll come back to you afterwards. Now, uh, where do we begin? Well, first of all, how many of you here are familiar with the term soft power? Soft power. How many of you are familiar with the term soft power? What does it mean? Yeah? So we'll do a quick uh, run through. I mean, so soft power was first coined by the American uh, academic Joseph Nye. And, uh, and this was in relation to hard power and soft power. Hard power being military power, which is uh, used by a state in order to achieve its uh, objectives, um, namely its foreign policy objectives. And soft power is the ability to get the other party 
to do what you want them to do through non-coercive means. For, so for, for the use of no force whatsoever. Uh, and no force, but also no financial transaction as well. So if there's any financial transaction, that is, seen, that is deemed as a, hard, a form of hard power because there is um, a, a transaction in place. So you are behaving according to this financial transaction that's been given. Whereas smart power is, uh, sorry, soft power is actually the ability to use culture, sport, media, uh, fashion, music, food. Um, all of these elements are, we consider pillars of soft power. And these pillars of soft power can be used as a way of uh, interacting with other groups of people as a medium of exchange and to attract the other to get them to do what you wanted to do without uh, any use of force. And smart power, the final one, is actually a mixture of the two. So you're not only uh, utilizing particularly one, which is soft power or hard power, but actually the ability to use both, uh, depending on your foreign policy objectives and your strategy, that is a form of uh, soft, uh, smart power. And so why have we put wisdom at the beginning of this title, and then we've put soft power, and then trying to find out how to solve global challenges through what? Social and cultural uh, entrepreneurship. Because uh, it's really important for us to understand that the world that we live in, of course, there are a lot of different scapes, we call them. So there's like different landscapes that we, that we look at. There is political, economical, social, technological. All of these landscapes provide a lens for us to view society. Um, and that lens helps us to decipher some of the social ills, some of the economic issues that are faced within a local, national, and global context, uh, including uh, regional and geopolitics as well. The reason why uh, deliberately those two words were chosen, social and cultural, because they're not forms, they are for, basically, they encompass most of what we would be talking about under soft power. Anything else that sits outside of that is outside of the realm of social and cultural entrepreneurship, and we see it as a form of hard power. So like technology, we can include that under um, uh, cultural and uh, social entrepreneurship. Um, and of course, entrepreneurship here, we know enterprises are for a social, social good and social impact. Um, now, the, the idea is, uh, often when we talk about these things, it is to remember first and foremost that uh, in the Islamic tradition and in the uh, Sharq tradition, uh, it is really important to understand where do we position ourselves in today's world. And that is the most important uh, starting point, if I can say, uh, in all of this, is understanding where we are. Because often we, f we find ourselves uh, in a weird space, confused, um, with multiple identities. Um, where do I belong? Is there almost a crisis of trying to fit in? And look at us all here. We're from all around the world, but we're stationed here in, in Istanbul, for example, the, the world's meeting place, as they say. Um, and it's no coincidence that we are all meeting here tonight. It, it was written, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote, you know, wrote that this is happening tonight at this hour, at this time, at this date, at this office, uh, and all of you here in attendance. Um, and what I would like us to do at, the, at the, today's session, inshallah, is be in a position where we can feel more confident about our identity, less confused, less of a feeling of there's a crisis, but actually we're now more, of, more in control. We have a better understanding of belonging and where do we belong and also how to solve some of the world's problems as well. We're gonna do all of that tonight. So we will solve the world's problems tonight, inshallah. Okay? Are you excited? Yeah. Clearly not. Yeah, not. Yeah. We're gonna solve the world's problems tonight, guys. Okay? Ahmed, over to you. Okay. So uh, the first question is, how can we use faith to help navigate through global challenges? Okay, excellent so, start. So, how do we use faith to navigate global challenges? 
we all know that Islam, the word Islam, is to do what? Submit. Yeah? Submit to who? To God. And our definition or understanding of that submission, uh, is it purely submission in terms of following the rules, Islamic jurisprudence? Or beyond that? More? How? How, how more? Why more? Is it just to follow the five pillars of Islam to submit? Lifestyle? Spirit? Yeah. Okay. Someone says spiritual lifestyle. Connection to God, yeah. Anyone else? What does, what does submission to God mean to you personally? I'm not looking for right answers. This is like, don't worry, you can. What does submission, what does, if someone comes, stops you on the street and says, you know, oh, you're Muslim, and they say, what does Islam mean? I keep on hearing this word Islam. What does it actually mean? I know it's a religion, but does Islam mean anything? And you say to them, yeah, it means submission to God. What is Okay, whatever comes from God. Okay, so whatever comes from God means there's something not coming from God. No, everything. Ah, see? <laughs> now you said everything comes from God. Okay, so not whatever comes from God. Okay, so everything that comes from God, the submission. Okay. Okay. He's a creator. Ahmed, what does uh, submission to Islam mean to you? Well, uh, so, and on a political level or? It could be anything. <laughs> I said, what does it mean to you? So, I didn't, yeah, what uh, does it mean to you? Well, it's, it's an interesting, because the way you ask the question, if, if someone asks, someone who doesn't know about Islam, right? And in that sense, um, I believe it's lead by example. Lead by example. That's us being as a Muslim. So what submission is to to be the the, the person that Allah expected us to be and put us for us to be. Mm. That's when we have the hadith and the Quran, there are rules and ways of us for living, practicing, doing many things. That's for us following that. It's part of submission. Mm. And doing so when someone comes and asks me what is that, I would be like leading by example by doing those things. Mm. Mm. Okay. Anyone else? Wants to volunteer? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's only one person holding up their hand, so no one else wants to volunteer. Go ahead. to 
which both the plan or the group that we chose uh, ourselves, we instead met a woman that we didn't know and told them like, can I go to that place, to that, to that uh, station? It's way easier than going to that, like, uh, follow that uh, route. So it's something like that. Mm. It's more deep, but this is deep. Okay. No, no, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. So, so even the obstacles that we face is also part of uh, Allah's plan. Okay. All right. Yes, please go ahead. Believing that there is something bigger than every sense. Believing that there is something bigger than us in every sense, which is God. Okay. Yes. So, for me, submitting not only we we define our spiritual self as Allah was, but we do a social work in which we are doing good work for as a Khalifa in this world. So we doing good work to construct for a better world in this dunya. Mm, 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 mm. Which is going back to the leading by example mm. point here. Yes. I'm actually I'm glad you mentioned that because this is back to what the arkan of the iman, yeah. And so, uh, naturally, if someone asks what is Islam and you say submission to God, and then you say to lead by example. Mm, but what if I lead by example and not submit to God? It's a bit fluffy, you know. It's not. There's no substance. Do you see where I'm coming from? It needs to be. Like when you say submission to God, no, no basically what I'm, the reason for this exercise is to really force you guys to think about the words you are choosing and how you're actually uh, ex explaining yourselves and the answers you're giving. So when we say submission to God, we know that, of course. We submit to God, Islam, 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 fine, okay. But Islam doesn't actually say anything about God. You know, think about it. Islam says not, there's, no, there's no meaning of God in Islam. Right? Just purely from a linguistic perspective. Okay? So it could be submission to anything. But why, what sets it apart from any other uh, definition is, okay, if you want to be a Muslim, you need to do the following. These are the five pillars, and these are the pillars of uh, Iman. If you follow the pillars of Iman and you follow the pillars of Islam, then you are submitting. Right? You need to? Yeah, avoid what? What is okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. But fine. But we're now we're going into more the 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 technical, legal, you know, jurisprudence, Islamic law, etc. For me, I just wanted to focus on the very key word of a submission here. What does it mean? What let what to obey exactly? So to submit yourself to God is to like fully obey to a lifestyle which is according to the Prophet Muhammad He is the best of my, mankind. He came with the message of Islam and is to follow, you know, he, he is a guidance for all of us to follow and understand that this is how we should act to be an example for people, to how to treat our neighbors and so on and so forth. But the reason why I'm pushing you guys a little bit on this in terms of submission to God is purely in the sense for us to understand where is the starting point. Yeah, where is the starting point? So many of you here are studying different disciplines, uh, different subjects, um, whether it's social sciences, whether it's history, whether it's law, whether it's engineering, um, maths. If you're studying maths, then you know, you're really, really smart. Um, whether you're doing art, architecture, whatever it may be, whatever it may be, right? Whatever profession you are in, ultimately we all have a journey on this planet, and our starting point, our moral compass and guidance is as Muslims, right? That's part of, for, part of our identity, a strong part of our identity. Now, if we are, fail to grasp the definition and the deep meaning 
of what Islam means, then actually we, there's, there's, there's something missing or there's a void, there's a gap inside of us. And that's why we need to critically engage and think about what does the word submission actually mean, right? Because submission is different to follower. Submission is different to someone who is taking allegiance, like Baya. It's different. You can say it's maybe a synonym, it's, so, it's close to the word submission. But to submit, it's almost to what? Let go of everything. Right? And so we ha have come at a time where we verbally say we submit, but our hearts have not submitted. Right? Our tongues say we submit to God. Our brains say we submit to God. I mean, I'm Muslim. Of course I submit to God. I pray. <laughs> If I pray, if I fast Ramadan, of course I submit to God. But if your heart does not submit to God, then you're just scratching the surface. You haven't got any, anywhere deeper in terms of understanding what the submission means. And this is so important because everything that you do, I mean, one perfect example is, um, uh, I think it was two days ago, I went to see the new mosque, um, which is the Barbaros Hayratim Pasha Jami in Besiktas Levant. Uh, if you haven't been, I highly encourage you to go. Um, because the mosque, I found it in truly inspiring. So it's a mosque obviously based on the Ottoman um, uh, naval officer, um, Barbaros, or if you've watched Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, there's a, a, a Aiken name to Barbosa. Um, but he's heavily celebrated, of course, in, in, uh, in Turkey, in terms of his uh, naval um, battles in Tunis and Jazair in the Mediterranean. So I highly encourage you, if you haven't, read up a little bit about him and his history. But the mosque, why am I talking about this? The mosque is inspired by the Mediterranean waters. You'll see in the, like, the windows, it's done in the form of waves. And it's really beautiful. And also you see the um, uh, Seljuk uh, mosaic art uh, tile work in the mihrab, which uh, for the first time in 750 years has been inspired to, to, as, a, as a new uh, piece of uh, uh, tile work, uh, which is being reintroduced in this country um, since the Ottoman Empire. Now, all this is really powerful because I want to take your attention to uh, Mimar Sinan, who is considered as one of the most amazing uh, architects within the Ottoman Empire, probably the most uh, decorated uh, architect within the Ottoman Empire. And there were so many circumstances where he would be put in awkward positions by the Sultan to say to him, I want you to sign your work. And you know, he signed his work as, you know, Fakir Allah. Like he, he would sign his work like with, with not, a, not even humility, almost like uh, the complete opposite, discrediting his name, you know, in terms of signing off his piece of work. And you have to ask yourself, wh why? Why is this person doing something like this? And if you go deeper to the understanding that everything that we do, everything that we do is an act of submission to God and, and realigning our purpose, then you come to understand that actually, you know what? If I really want to submit, there's a lot of things that I need to stop doing. There's a lot of things I need to start doing. You know what I mean? So there's like, there's so many things, subhanAllah, that we are on a journey, of course, all of us, where we're, we are on this journey of, yes, we've submitted to God, but we're maybe at different paces. And we're all working on our own sort of uh, different struggles. And that's why I go back to, at the beginning of this uh, talk, I said, we're going to solve the world's problems tonight. Because honestly, 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 tawakkul is another thing that we say, and we love to put it in statuses on Twitter and WhatsApp and sharing a story on WhatsApp and forwarding onto the family group. Tawakkul and this and this in the Ma'al Usri Yusra. Please stop. Put it on the side. Okay. Look, your, look, in, look in the mirror and be absolutely honest with yourself. Do you actually believe the words that are coming out of your mouth? Do you, do you believe with conviction? This is the key word. Do you have this amazing conviction? where you say and you mean everything that you say. 
We did this little small exercise at the beginning. Just be careful of the words you say. Every single word that comes out of your mouth should be said with conviction. You know exactly what you're saying. And not expecting the other person to give you a get out of jail card and help you and be like, I understand what you mean. Do you, do you, do you guys get what I'm saying? So a lot, of, a lot of you here were probably thinking I was going to be easy. Oh, submit to Allah is to basically to um, follow him, etc. And that's it. And I'll be like, yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, moving on to the next topic. No, 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 no. When you say submit to Allah, I want you to actually critically engage and understand what does that even mean? For those who watch uh, wrestling or MMA, for example, a submission, what's a submission? Stop. Sorry? Stop. Yeah, like a submission is the other opponent does what? They tap. Yeah, they tap, they said, I can't take it anymore. You give up. There you go. Jazakallah khair. You give up. You give up, why? For the sake of Allah. So a submission is you tap, you give up for the sake of Allah. Do you get it? So that have that in the back of your head for everything we're going to be talking about later on. So this is how faith will help us is you have to start with, when you talk about La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, is submission. Um, the second question is, what is Sukha and how can we use it or utilize it in the local, national and global way? Perfect. So you, you remember we talked about soft power, the different elements? Yeah. Um, there's a very key word which is important, and that is attraction. Okay? Attraction is very, very important. Um, because soft power is attraction. Can someone give me an example of soft power? Yes, at the very end. Yeah, give me a case study. Like, um, uh, not, don't give me a, a category. So give me an example of soft power. That's a category. Media is a category. But can you give me a case study or an example? Qatar World Cup, expand. Yeah. Okay, where's the attraction? Qatar is the attraction? Sport. Football is the attraction. Okay. So sport. Okay. Yes, so I would say the human determination and wrongs in the physical government needs to be at the bottom of the law. As you know, as a soft power to enhance the influence of Turkey in the world. Okay, so uh, Turkey is doing the humanitarian aid work. Mm -hmm. Who's who is attracted to this? The recipients, basically. So those beneficiaries who are in need are attracted to Turkey as, yeah. What about someone who's not a recipient? Would they be, can they still be attracted? They can, because they see this humanitarian work of our FRA as the weakness of the country that is helping another country. Okay, great. Any other examples? The, let's go back to media. You said media. Uh, can you can you say that again, please? Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So 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 movies. So what, what's what's attractive by Netflix? Not the price. The price is very expensive. But what's attractive by Netflix? The content. The content. Okay. All right. Fine. Anything else? Yes. Sorry. Yes. You should. When I say yes, by the way, uh, I should ask your your name as well, please. So your name, and then so I know it's it's you who was who is speaking. Please, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, yeah, tourism, absolutely. So tourism is, a, you know, France uh, is known for its uh, Eiffel Tower, but also there could be some uh, uh, prejudices that we may have towards certain cuisines around the world, for example. Um, but they all are sort of in our minds connected to these spaces and places and countries, for example. So when you think of Italy now, this is this is just a case study. When you think of Italy now, what do you think of? Give me a, give me a hand and one word. Pizza. Pizza? Pasta. 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 Venice. Coliseum. Venice. 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 Oh, Venice. Yeah, Venice. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What else? Louder, louder. Football. Football? Really? They're really bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay, next one. Let's do Jamaica. Music? Music? Flag. Education. Education? Athletes. Athletes? Okay. England. Tea. Tea. Accent. 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 Food. Food. Really? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> London. London. Yep. Yeah. Royal family. Yep. Yeah. Big Ben. Red bus. Okay. Turkey. Chai. 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 I, you like your tea? Okay. Chai. 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 Huh? Cigarettes? No. Turkey cigarettes? You know you're right, you're right. Yeah. Okay. What else? Istanbul. Istanbul, yeah. Mosque. Simit, mosque. Okay. So these uh, connections, these reference points that you have made, they didn't come because you studied the country. Maybe you have studied the country. Um, but where have they come from? Stereotypes. Stereotypes, yeah. Some will be stereotypes. Some are factual, but some will be stereotypes. What else? Videos and movies. <coughs> Videos and movies. Videos and movies, yes. Excellent, yeah. So information, yeah. Your own experiences. Your own experiences, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So these are all um, basically reference points that we have picked up, whether direct or indirect. Right now, these are all to some of us can be our hobbies as well, whether it's sport, etc., and so on and so forth. So that's why these are a form of attraction in many ways. So, if you're let's say someone who's very interested in food and gastronomy around the world, okay, you would love to explore the world through the lens of gastronomy and be like, you know what, I love food so much, so I want to create almost like a um, become a a food diplomat around the world and then try different foods, for example. But uh, if you look at, for example, some of the rich resources of a country in terms of a soft power, we, this is, and, I'm, and I don't mean this from a stereotype, I mean actually that the central state acknowledges that it has strong resources of soft power. So let's say from the countries that you're from, let's say, if you know, great, if you don't, no problem. But from the countries that you're from, are you aware of what strong soft power resources is being invested by the state, by the country? What is important to them? And by the way, you can't say trade, because you remember what we said at the beginning? Like basically, yeah, we, I mean, it's a form of soft power, but we want to sort of look at more of the cultural, social elements for, for today's discussion. You're from Egypt, okay. The media and music. Me yes, yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Very, very, very strong soft power. Yeah. There. Yeah. Excellent, yeah, precisely. And of course, tourism. Yeah. Right? So Khardan, the Red Sea and the pyramids in Giza. Tourism really, really important, right? And what it does also for the economy is also very, very important in terms of uh, bringing in uh, a lot of tourists and also sustaining the, the economy. I have a question. Is it about what the government and state is trying to promote or what the world uh, sees about that country? This particular question yeah. is about the state. 
what the what the state is investing in. Yeah. But we don't know how to, how, how, how our country wants to express itself. I would say basically true. And we, I am just going to stereotype about the current situation in our country. But yeah, maybe, maybe this is true. Is it just uh, tourism as well? Yeah. Yeah. This is why, I'll come to you in a bit. This is why, it's, this is so important. You said here the image, right? You know what the image of the world thinks of you. Now, what did we say about soft power? It's a way of how you can get the other to do what you want them to do or maybe change their perception through what non-coercive means. Soft power, like the, the brother you mentioned, the Qatar World Cup, for example. So the Qatar World Cup was, football obviously is the attraction. It's a global language. Okay? There are millions and millions of fans around the world who follow football. And we saw in Qatar, it was the first host country in the Middle East and the first Muslim-majority country to host the World Cup as well. So for Qatar, it was an opportunity to showcase its culture, its heritage, its identity to the world, because it knows that the world is coming to Qatar for the World Cup, right? And, and in your point here around Iraq, so its idea is how can we promote and show the image of Iraq to the world? And the, the brother who just left here talked about uh, uh, religion, but also we said, I think, food elsewhere. Food, uh, there was a, uh, a soft power project, uh, which is cultural diplomacy. So soft power is the theory, guys, yeah? We all, we all agree that this is a theory, okay? Now, when we say soft power in practice, we can call it food diplomacy. This is a term, gastro diplomacy, sport diplomacy, Qatar World Cup, okay? Um, cultural diplomacy, right? Uh, which looks at music, fashion, and uh, architecture, and so on and so forth. Now, a form of gastro diplomacy that I saw, which uh, was in America, was a guy who was, had a food cart, and he was showing, he was treating people to Iraqi food in a food cart, and this was at the time of the Iraq War, and this was an opportunity for what people-to-people -people diplomacy, right, to reach out to the other, to actually, as you say, change the perception. So when you build a bridge through this technique, you have the ability now to change perception, to create dialogue and communication. So soft power is great in theory, okay? But actually, how do we practice soft power? This is the really exciting part, really, of our discussion, is how do we practice soft power? And what can you guys do here in this room to actually do it on an individual level, on a, on a personal level? Yes, we talked about some of the state stuff, like Egypt, for example, and movies. Huge investment in terms of movies, uh, in terms of theater as well. And it's renowned. In the Arab world, Egypt is renowned for the movies and the, the theaters. And the production level is, is one of the highest uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. So other countries, Turkey, for example. Remember, you remember COVID? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, it revealed again an identity of these countries. Yeah. And so the, 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 the heritage is, 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 is very, very important, absolutely. Um, and this is connected to tourism as well. Yeah. You know, it's huge. If you remember in COVID, the second year of COVID, this, this was the opportunity for people to start traveling a little bit. The amount of people traveling to Turkey was phenomenal, it was really, really high and actually helped a lot. For, for Turkey to bring in um, uh, uh, and strengthen the economy with, with, uh, with tourism. So at a state level, right, there are certain areas, whether it's movie, Hollywood, Hollywood in America, huge soft power. I mean, it's probably one of the biggest soft power producers in the world, right? Where is Netflix, where is Netflix based out of, right? Where's Apple based out of? Where's Microsoft based out of? You know, these are mega, mega monster companies which are, 
um, in, a, in a positive way, by the way, when I say monsters. Okay, I don't mean it in a bad way. So these are huge, huge companies who have the ability to uh, produce uh, a lot of soft power and culture, right? The way we think, the way we talk, the way we communicate, the way we work even now, for example. So now all of us are very familiar with Zoom and Teams, for example, you know? Like this has changed the way we, we, we live. Um, so in many ways, these are soft power producers. So think to yourself, when you're thinking of soft power, who are the big producers of soft power? In which industry, in which sector they're in? And then when you see the practice of soft power in cultural diplomacy, in other terms, this is now basically the, the practice arm. And then you may find the technique, which is very interesting. I want to bring to your attention something very quickly before we move on to, to the next bit and actually how you can use soft power is like this example of the uh, Iraqi gentleman in the US. Um, uh, and this is one that happened, I think it was yesterday. So there was a Ukraine conference in London. Um, did anyone notice or follow the news? So there's a Ukraine conference in London which is around how to support and rebuild Ukraine. So many of the state leaders uh, were in London for this, foreign ministers, Hakan Fidan was there. Um, and, and others, and also um, um, the U.S. Uh, Foreign Secretary also was there. And there was a clip, I'm not sure if you've seen the clip, but the U.S. Foreign Secretary and also Hakan Fidan are speaking um, for the first time in London together, um, and they were talking about uh, their support and what to do in the Ukraine situation. And it was really interesting to see that actually, on, if you look at the American delegation, uh, who was sat along with them? So uh, there was one person that stood out, which was a sister who wears hijab, um, and her name, subhanAllah, I forgot her name, but um, she's very, she's famous, she's Lebanese, she's blind, um, but also does a lot of work, incredible work in terms of accessibility um, within the US. She was sat on that side of the table, okay? Now, to, to someone watching this, you know, that technique is quite deliberate. Okay, that you have someone in that sort of uh, style of diplomacy. Now, this is obviously state to state level diplomacy. But what I'm saying is there are elements of technique as well, which is really, really important. So you can practice well, that. That is something called summitary diplomacy. So when you're at a summit, it's called summitary diplomacy. There are elements, let's say, of let's say who, who, how the handshake is. If you're shaking like your hand like this and you're doing this, for example, this is a form of like you have more control and authority. You're putting the hand here, for example. If you shake like this, if you shake like this with two hands, for example. These are all small techniques of like the body language and the power play in between people. Now, summary diplomacy is when you've got two uh, of, uh, of the representatives sitting in front of each other. This was this element here, this example I mentioned, is very, very interesting because obviously they're talking to two here. Yeah? And so the idea is that this was very deliberate. Why is this person here, for example? Maybe to show that actually, look, we have someone here that, uh, you know, from our, from, from our country, for example, who we are supporting and promoting these voices who unfortunately maybe are not being promoted elsewhere, for example. So this is a technique which is done at a very high state level. But if on, on a local level, how can soft power help us? Um, I will share an example with you, with you all in terms of what Ahmed mentioned at the beginning about uh, something we set up in London, which is a Ramadan 10 project. Now, we use the month of Ramadan as a means to build bridges and share awareness about Islam. Why do we do this? There's always a why to everything. Why are you doing this? Perfect here. There's a problem. What is the problem? Perception of Iraq outside of Iraq. We need to change that. That's the problem. Okay. Now we understand the why. Let's look at how. Let's look at when. Let's look at where. Right? These are the questions that we need to think about to then implement how we can uh, do it on a, on a daily life. The problem in the UK is what? Over 90% of UK adults have not been to a mosque. Islamophobia is increasing. In Europe, but also in the UK, we see that the anti-religious hate crimes, the highest proportion to any uh, religious group is Muslims. Uh, I will still say it is much, much better to live in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. It's probably the best place to, to, to live as a Muslim uh, in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. But we've identified the why, okay? Why we're we doing this. There's increased isolation. The youth feel isolated. They don't feel a sense of belonging. They don't feel confident about their faith. Um, so, uh, and we see also there is people who are outside of Islam who actually don't know enough about Islam or Ramadan and maybe feel a sense of fear that they don't want to go to a mosque. They feel fear. They don't want to feel judged. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go out to public spaces, have iftar, 
and invite everyone and anyone to come, right? So that was a form of what cultural public diplomacy that we're doing to actually bring communities together. Now, there's a really interesting theme that runs in all of this. You can be one of two groups in this world, okay? You can be one of two groups in this world. You can be someone who breaks and divides, or you can be someone who brings people together and bridges, okay? So you can build bridges. So you either bomb bridges or you build bridges, okay? So you can either uh, uh, tell people to not cross the bridge or tell people to cross the bridge, right? And this is the idea of individuality and community. And this is really important because it runs through the idea of some of the challenges, global challenges, that we face in everything. If we are to face global challenges on an individual level, we will get nowhere, right? It is only through the ability that we are able to collectively work together, pull resources together, that we're able to face uh, global challenges and overcome them. So it's about bridging between one another. We need to bridge, really important. And before we bridge, we need to go back to what? The idea of submission. If my submission means to absolutely give up, and I need to what? I need to, first of all, build my bridge with who? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got it? I need to build my bridge with Allah, and I want to cross the bridge. But if I'm not building the bridge of Allah, then how am I expecting to build bridges with people? Because it's only by virtue of you building this bridge toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're able to then, Allah blesses you with building bridges around others. Okay. Um, so we, we're moving on to the second or third question, which is uh, identity, purpose, and belonging, the identity crisis. How did we get here, especially with the youth? They have too many identity crises or struggling with belonging. And what is the best way of self-liberation? So, you know, often uh, when I speak to the youth, there is uh, a problem of who is your inspirer? You know, who is your role model? Who is the person that has gone above and beyond? It doesn't have to be someone famous. Think of that person in your head right now. For example, who is your role model? And keep it to yourself. You don't need to share it. Just keep that in your head, the role model person. And there's a, there's a number of things. The identity issue is we need to uh, accept that identity is never fixed. If we, if we believe that identity is fixed, then we'll live all our lives in fear. In fear of what? In fear of why is this person coming to my country taking my job? Yeah? Why are these people coming here? Why are these people doing this? Because of why? Because of my identity. Well, that's the problem. The starting point is your definition and understanding of identity. We now live in a globalized world where we're all speaking English in Istanbul, which is ironic because stats suggest 60 to 70% of Turks don't speak a second language. So the fact that we're speaking English in Istanbul, you know, goes to show the length globalization is at, right? There are more McDonald's in the world than, uh, what was the stats? Uh, I need to remember. I think there are more McDonald's in the world than recognized states. Can you believe that? There are more McDonald's in the world than actual recognized countries. At least in Istanbul alone. Yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> but like, everyone resonates with the M, the McDonald's M wherever you go. 
Oh, look, McDonald's. Okay, yeah. That's yeah, the golden arches, exactly. You know, you recognize with that. That is the power of, you know, that, that's of course soft power. That's a power of like uh, branding and marketing, of course, but the power of you be able to resonate with that. And so identity in many ways is familiarity. Your identity is, a, is, is what are you familiar with? You see a Starbucks, great. You see a McDonald's, brilliant. Um, see a Burger King, even better. KFC, even better. Like, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Every single shopping mall across this nation is pretty much the same thing. No? It's got the same stores everywhere. <laughs> the same stores. And not even this, you look at every country. You know, most, most malls have the same sort of, you know, they're, they're everywhere. Okay, so why? Okay? What, what, you know, I'm the consumer. I'm just blindly just going and this and this, etc. Why? Again, this is just to, for you to critically engage here, okay? We're not saying it's right or it's wrong. What we're saying is you need to ask yourself why question. Just as we ask the question about why Islam means Islam. Ask the question why about everything, first and foremost. Your identity, okay, it's great to know that where you have come from, but your identity in terms of where you are going, it's not fixed. And you need to accept that it's not fixed. The more we are open to accepting that identity is fluid, is ever-changing, and the fact that, you know what, I came from a first generation of people who were from Libya, for example, and then they settled in France, and then I settled in Sweden, and I speak these languages, is perfectly okay. And, it, and it's normal sometimes that we feel that sense of fear, it, it, because we're human, you know? We, 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 we want that sense of what, I go back to, familiarity, right? That sense of belonging. So this identity crisis, in many ways, is in search of what belonging. Where do I belong? That's why we have this identity crisis, in many ways. Is that where, where do we belong? And I go back to what? Revelation. Like the very first thing, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has presented us with the Quran. If we, if we have said at the very beginning of this talk that we have submitted to Allah, then let's go back to that, all right? What, what do we know about identity when we submit to Allah and belonging? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, right? We belong to God. So wherever we are on this planet, wherever we go, whatever language we speak, whatever city we were born in, whatever country we, what we work in, wherever countries we've traveled to, we always remember this is all temporary in many ways. So the life that we live here is temporary. And then actually, so then the identity crisis element is purely a subjective one. Because I was born in so-and-so place and so-and-so place. I was raised in so-and-so languages. Um, and so the, the ability for us to integrate better in communities is to go back to submitting to Allah. If you truly submit to God, wherever you are in this world, you should be able to integrate in your society. Because submitting to God is what? Being at service to the people. Servitude. Service to the people, right? Is what added benefit are you giving? Added value are you giving? Allah created us, alhamdulillah. Allah has given us life, alhamdulillah. But Allah doesn't need us. Why were you created? Because Allah needs your prayers? No. Allah doesn't need your prayers. Allah doesn't need your istighfar. You need, you need Allah. But Allah created you. And that is the biggest blessing and gift that we take for granted sometimes. We forget. And I go, again, I go back to uttering submission to Allah, but actually how our, how our hearts really submitted or not. And so the solution really for us is like, how do we look at the uh, identity crisis question and understanding our sense of belonging is our belonging is connected to us submitting to God. Does that make sense? Are you in agreement or disagreement? Or confused or unsure? Confused? 
Okay. Our definition of belonging is connected to Allah. So we can solve the identity crisis by saying equals belonging to Allah. Does that help? Clarify the statement more and more. Not more, but more and more. <laughs> MashaAllah, you need a one to one. You need a one to one session. <laughs> Okay, well, before we get to that, the, the lady behind you. When I was Where were you before, sorry? Iraq. Iraq, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know um, the word belonging. I've, I've said this before. The word belonging in Arabic is what? Intima. Intima. And what is the uh, root word of intima? Mm -hmm. Nama. What does nama mean? So identity is not fixed. Identity is about growth. That's your that's your secret formula. So actually to look at identity crisis and actually, and this is why we said wisdom at the beginning, because all of this is wisdom, 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 right? Is how do we look at identity crisis and now add some wisdom on top and then flip it and be like, actually, this is not identity crisis. This is my feeling that I am growing. What happens when you grow? You change, okay, but what, 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 what involves the process of growth? Experience. Fear, experience. Pain. Who said pain? Bonus point. Pain. You need pain. Subhanallah. Inna ma'al usri yusra. See how it's all now coming together? At first you're like, where is this going? I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about geopolitics and this and this and solving the world's problems. How it, but we are. If we address these things on an individual level, we can solve any problem in the world, honestly. Honestly. If you think the way that our growth is connected to pain, to trauma, to bad experiences, this is all a process of growth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we go back to the Qur'an, because what, what I said is, at the beginning is, if we are submitting to God, then we have the answers. We just need to understand what, where is the hikmah. And hikmah, wisdom, is a gift Allah gives to the believers. Let me say that again, because this is really powerful. Hikmah does not come because of old age. Some people are old. And they have no hikmah whatsoever. They have no wisdom. Some people are young and they've got incredible amount of wisdom. Like, wait, wait, what did you do? Did you, you know, go away to in Bali and uh, read just books for like 24-7? What happened to you? And you've come back like a monk and that's it. Now, you know, and you speak only in three words. Every sentence is three words. That's it. You don't know more than three words. Hikmah is a gift given by Allah to the believers. This is so powerful. Really powerful. Yeah, exactly. This is really, really powerful. Because this is now the full circle of understanding our submission is to completely give up and completely what? Tawakkul. 
when we're faced with a problem, tawakkul, growth, moving forward. Right? And you build this wisdom. You build this hikmah from this. Because if you have all the in- knowledge in the world and you have no hikmah, sorry, we can't cash in your currency. We're closed. But if you have huge hikmah and little, I, not even you know, a university degree, but you have huge hikmah, we're ready, we're open. Let's cash in. Because that is a sign that you have completely given up, submitted, and given your tawakkul on Allah. Honestly, sometimes we face problems, whether it's professional, whether it's personal, whether it's uh, geopolitical, whether it's economical, social, uh, cultural, whatever it may be, any problem that we face, even these global challenges we're facing. If we truly believe that we must make tawakkul, of course you have to tie your camel. Okay, I'm not. This is. This, I'm not saying okay tawakkul. That's it. And you know, like uh, yeah, you go. You don't. You don't. You don't jump off the river. And say tawakkul. You know, come on. There's there's aqal. There's a bit of it. This, this, this is not matrix. Okay, you can't jump off the, the cliff and uh, and expect to sort of fly around, but. You have to also be mindful that there is everything that we're facing. If we use the mindset, because the mindset is everything here. If our mindset is looking at how we can apply wisdom in our day-to-day work, in our day-to-day lives, and use, again, the intelligence the, of you know, some of the key components we've mentioned here, which is what soft power, the different forms and practicalities of uh, the day-to-day diplomacy we want to do, whether it's personal, uh, or whether it's with a group, these are all elements which we can actually affect positive change. And as we said, what is the why, the problem, the social ill that you see in this world? Why? What is it? Right? And why do you want to change this? Like, what, what's, what's your burning desire? What's your passion behind this? What is it you want to change? Then you can look at the how, where, and when. And if you apply that matrix alongside you making tawakkul, I'm submitting to Allah, then fine. But that is the blueprint, that's a standard blueprint for everyone. Okay? The submission, the tawakkul, the intima, the growth, all of that is basically the blueprint that we have. Where you are now as Ahmad, Musa, Maryam, whatever it is, where you are now in this world in terms of your passion, this here is your purpose in this life. Does that make sense? What is your purpose in this life? Because remember we said that Allah did not create you for your prayers. You, know, you were created for a specific ob- uh, need. Like the doctor when he's operating on the patient, that's the purpose right there. The purpose is that. When you've studied all these years, you're like, well, I don't know why. Then you find out why. Allah placed you in a position. You get that moment? No? Sometimes you get that moment or sometimes you hear these stories. The timing, the timing is just perfect. That's because Allah is, is, is the curator of all things. Right? And so, if we live a world where we're doing what we're doing day to day, disconnected from our understanding of submission, our understanding of belonging, our understanding of what tawakkul means, then we will not be able to obtain hikmah. Because hikmah is the, like the golden ticket to unlocking all of the social problems that we have. Okay. Um, Sorry, Ahmad, I know it's heavy for you. <laughs> you know, it's at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, this, this makes me think of what creative ideas can we have? What solutions can we put forward for us to move on and to find? Great. So let's uh, let's ask. What has anyone here got a passion project or a social ill they really they really are passionate about? and want to fix. Yeah. Does anyone here have a passion about a topic? I mean, sorry, your sister, uh, your name. Hafsa mentioned Iraq, for example. Yeah. That was a great example. Does anyone have a similar example where we're talking about something which is personal, passionate about, um, wants to change in the world? What do you want to change? What do you? I'm not, not, I'm not asking for an answer, so then you sound good in front of everyone else. 
I'm asking for a question that you. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Brilliant. Anything anything else? Anyone else? Yes. So you want to be the PR campaigner for politicians, basically improve their image. Wow, what a what a job! They'll, you you definitely have a job, by the way. You have so you have so many politicians lining up to, to take you on. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that. Anyone else? No, no, no. You for you for you, personally you. What what's your personal? Yeah, we, we talk about the Ummah now and uh, we're going to start thinking about the, the, how to solve the Ummah. We're not, we're not, by the way, have you, have you noticed? We're not talking about, uh, because this is actually an arrogant way of thinking in terms of thinking, okay, the problem is this, so we need to now solve the problem for effort. On an individual level, by the way, guys, I'm going back to the individual level because you all individually carry the key to solve the, 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 the problem. You all carry the solution. You, are, have, you have creative minds. If you think of the solutions yourself here right now, you leave this room today, you think, okay, you know what? Uh, I need to now realign my thinking in terms of my submission. What does this mean? I need to go deeper. What does happiness mean in Islam, for example? All right? What is true happiness? True happiness for me in Islam is what? There is no happiness? You're like, there's no happiness? There is happiness, right? What, what forms of happiness are there? Sorry? Rida, yes. We, we, we also have uh, happiness in this world. I, I want to go and have ice cream, no? No? Is that a form of happiness in Islam? It is, no? Okay. What else is happiness in Islam? Netflix? Yeah? Yeah? Netflix? Yeah? Sorry. Is, is it? Satisfied. Yeah? What, what satisfies me, yeah? Okay. These are all, I mean, of course, if it's allowed, okay? Don't, I'm not saying everything that you, you, yeah, okay? So, but if you look in the realms of like happiness in Islam, actually there's different forms. There is one of this dunya, okay? The happiness of this dunya, right? But then there's also, we know that there's the ultimate happiness, which is in the hereafter, okay? We know. And that's connected back to the point that we mentioned about our alignment of submission to God, etc. So there is, you know, that's why we say, Rabbina atina fi ad dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana, right? Not al akhirah only and another dunya. No, you can have both. Why not? And so there is happiness in this world. If you like sports, I like, I like sports. I like to play sports. That brings me happiness. So I like to play sports. That brings me happiness. Fine. But, okay, if I had to... And this is the thing. I don't know why, subhanAllah, but we always try to make things difficult for each other uh, and for ourselves by thinking in black and white. There's almost, there's almost a dichotomy for every, in everything that we face. Someone if I had Sakina. someone said Sakina, Alhamdulillah, we got there. Who is this person? Rakib. Okay. Rakib, sorry. So just stay. Thank you very much to them because <laughs> this is what the ultimate idea is. What we need. Everything we just discussed, basically in terms of our submission, our reliance, the tawakkul, etc. 
is a form of what sakina. The moment that we have sakina in our lives, the moment we feel everything is what's going according to the plan. And, and the sakina is the ultimate form of happiness because whatever you are thrown against, whatever you are faced, is actually you take it head on, you take it with wisdom, with hikmah, and then you follow through it. Any other uh, passion projects that we have? We have architecture, we have um, cultural, Action. we have political. Mine is education, that's what I'm about. Education, okay. Data and how data can help people make better decisions and understand what's the right thing to do. Brilliant. Very good. Uh, also, the same thing for me because we talked about that. Uh, I love to use the knowledge of data science and or predictions and forecasting. Algorithms. And, uh, yeah, in healthcare. Search engines. Yeah, in healthcare. No, I mean, it's not search engines. Yeah. Like in healthcare, you said. Yeah. yeah. Do you believe working as a data scientist saves lives? Uh, it, it depends on which domain you are. No, but do you believe it can? Okay. Good. No, it can. You're right. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's obviously practical things. Like if I arrive and I haven't got a SIM card and phone number, to work good. like, okay, but I need to contact this person. I need a SIM card. I need the phone. It's like, yeah, just to work good, you know, just think, you know, like uh, go and, you know. Telepathy. Bro, I need to order a taxi to take me to the hotel to make it for the conference. What do you mean to work good? I need, okay, I need, I, so practically you need to do these things, correct? But sometimes... Like, uh, there's like this uh, superpower, you know? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents something like that, and then you're like, where did that come from? I, I literally was just wanting to do this, this, and this, and something happened, subhanAllah. Where did this come from? And it's like the answer came from the, from the sky and just landed on you, like literally like that. And, you know, there are so many stories. When you look at the seerah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, like there are so many, so many stories where, you know, people were tested in terms of their patience, tested in terms of their iman. But then there was what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented them with, the, 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 the accepting their dua. And in, in life, we need to remember that these creative solutions are a form of us having to think critically is so, so important. What was the local language or the local sort of um, uh, popular, um, like for example now, what's popular now amongst the youth? AI? AI? Really? AI is popular amongst the youth? TikTok. I thought TikTok, yeah, TikTok. TikTok is more, but what else is popular amongst the youth? Instagram. Instagram. What else? Guys, are you, are you, are you the youth? Are you, like, yeah. Everyone, you, you guys seem so like, yeah. Games? Okay. What's also popular? Netflix, again, Netflix? <laughs> Can we get the, like a membership for everyone? Like, maybe? Influencers? Yeah. Influences. Don't get me started on influences. Okay. <laughs> Where to begin on influences? Okay. Uh, 
What, okay, so what, what's really popular amongst the youth? We mentioned social media, all of these things. Okay, what is the language of the youth today? Trends. Trends? Okay. What is the language of the youth? English. <laughs> English. What else? Language of the youth is money. Okay, happiness. money. Happiness. happiness? happiness. You're, I like you. You're a philosopher. I like you. No, yeah. Not that much. Not that much? Data scientist? <laughs> no. What else? What's the language of the youth? Fun. Fun? Yes. Okay. Appearance. Appearance? Okay. Achievement. What attracts the youth? You know, we talked about attraction is very important. What's what's attracting the youth? YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, Instant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Freedom, yeah. Some of the suggestions on Zoom. Yeah. Showing off, success, instant gratification, gratification. Yeah. Uh, easy and success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so these are. Um, some of the maybe outputs we can say, but if we were to try and speak to the youth now, how can we speak to the youth to attract them? Yeah, uh, sorry, I don't mean the, the content. I mean, what, what technique, what do we use? You know, we talked about sport, et cetera, et cetera, all these different things, these different uh, elements. What can we use as a technique to speak to the youth? Social media. Social media. Okay, perfect. Social media. Yeah. So what was the way in which the Prophet spoke to at the time of uh, the message was sent? In the Arabs. You know, the Arab, the, the Arab region? Mm -hmm. What was the equivalent of social media back then? Poet. Yes. Poetry. So, poetry was like social media amongst the Arabs. So, what was the answer to poetry? poetry. The answer to poetry was poetry? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Say it. The Quran. Remember? And yes. Yes, correct. Both of you correct, yes. So poetry with poetry and obviously the Qur'an. When the Qur'an came down, what did the Arabs say? Magic, what else? Yeah. Where does this come from, you know? What, what, what is this? What is this book that rhymes so well and has these deep meanings and, you know? Like, and so if there is a social ill or as a problem, remember, when we talk about creative solutions, this is why we're saying this, if you identify a problem, make sure your solution is connected to the problem. Because if you apply something as a solution which is disconnected from the problem in terms of the technique and the language, then your ability to attract that group is not going to be as high, all right? That's why it's really important to understand that if it's social media now, which the youth are using so much and following and, and that's attracting them, okay, how can we utilize social media now to try and get people attracted to other works, for example, right? 
And I don't mean here, you know, I'm basically I'm, I'm saying you use the medium of social media as a means of attracting the youth to then showcase some of the passion projects that you, you were speaking about, right? So that's why I didn't say the content. What is it exactly you want to do? Because these are all personal projects that you have and you're working on. But in terms of connecting and actually speaking to the audiences around how you want to engage people or share these things, social media is a great way. You know, we did something with Chelsea Football Club, the very first iftar in the history of Chelsea Football Club in the stadium, okay? Like, did anyone hear about this? Okay, so we organized this in London, our team. And this went viral. We didn't plan for it to be viral. But, yeah, Chelsea Football Club, yeah. So when this happened, for example, it went viral, it went, you know, really, really, you know, uh, crazy in terms of the coverage and the interest. Uh, and, and a lot of people, young people, on social media. So many who love football, who follow footballers, etc. When they saw this, they were like, this is amazing. The, 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 the means is not the ends, right? So the end actually is going beyond the fact that this is on social media. Let's now look at what, what is the purpose of this event? Why is this event happening in a football stadium? So you go deeper, right? Then you hear actually this happening in different places. And this is about Ramadan. Oh, what's Ramadan? And there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. So basically the social media here is a meeting place. Right? And, and, to, and the same, subhanAllah, when it came down to the Quran. When there was poetry, then you actually answer the poetry with also poets, but also the Quran. And that is a gateway. It's like a window to a new world, basically. And so... For those who are thinking about a problem and the solution, the creative element is how are you doing the invitation? This is so important. And in our understanding of how to be in, like in diplomacy, we say there is attraction and there's also invitation. Right? Because when someone is attracted, okay, you need invitation also running aside it to feel that sense of welcome right uh, and this is the idea of how there are uh, specific exchange programs for students for example let's say right that's an invitation or a master scholarship right the attraction is Turkey it's already attractive you know the country the city Istanbul the food the mosque the Adan you know, it's very attractive. The invitation is what? The master scholarships, right? The master scholarship is not the attraction because when you look at master scholarship and then you see uh, Italy and you don't like pasta, then you're not gonna go to Italy, right? Everyone loves, everyone, everyone loves pasta, right? You love pasta? Uh, like not that much, yeah. but you like pasta? Yeah, pasta is Alhamdulillah, okay. Um, Anyone here does not like pasta? No, okay. Right. Oh, we do have one. We have one person who doesn't like pasta. You don't like pasta? Okay, I will not ask why. <laughs> He's giving me a very serious note. Because, because you are from Sudan. I'm not even going to ask why, because <laughs> you are from Sudan. <laughs> what, what, what do Sudanese people have? There you go, you're just creating a stereotype now. What do Sudanese people have against pasta? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> So, no, no, no. It's fine. You can love and like whatever you want. You know? But the, the idea is the invitation is important. Okay? Attraction is great. But if there's no invitation of the attraction, then that's why uh, um, you are not able to create that sort of uh, transfer of um, people uh, changing their perception, for example, or, or affecting that positive change for perception or solving solutions, for example. Those are, the, those are the, the very important elements. So creative solutions. I'll give you one more example, the final one, and then we can, we can end there with a Q&A, for example. But I think uh, uh, spe specifically with uh, our organization, this year we've done something different for the very first time. This year we were celebrating our 10-year anniversary, and we introduced something called the Ramadan Pavilion. So Pavilion is a architectural installation structure and we built this in the Victorian Albert Museum. How many of you have been, have been uh, to London? 
We need to work on those Schengen visas. Okay. All right. It's not Schengen. It's never been Schengen. Schengen plus UK now. It's not even, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not it's even. It's never been Schengen. It was never, you're correct. Yeah. No, you're actually right. Um, so I'm very sorry on behalf of everyone who voted for Brexit in the UK. But, um, okay, when you do go to London, right, um, there is the museum called the Victorian Albert Museum. It's the world's leading design and art museum. Uh, very, very famous. And we built a pavilion structure called the Ramadan Pavilion. And it was the concept of a modern mosque, uh, showing the evolution of British mosques uh, and how they have changed over the years, right? Now, in Britain, the diaspora Muslim community in Britain is a mixture of Bangladeshi mostly, then Pakistani and Indian. And then you have Arabs and you have Turks, then you have people from uh, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, a, a mixture of, of all communities. And so the mosques that were built, uh, are built in the UK, we can see an early uh, um, my, uh, you know, uh, migration history into Britain. We see that actually there is a, there's a fusion of, let's say, Victorian uh, buildings with early Islamic architecture taking place. So it's like a weird fusion, like a, like a Gothic Victorian building, for example, um, that used to be maybe a church, which is now converted into a mosque, and there's a dome on top. So you see the really interesting like juxtaposition of these two different uh, architectures coming head to head. That shows like the early sort of uh, uh, evolution. And of course, it moves on and on and on and on. It's a bit like mosques here in Turkey, for example. You know, you have the, the Ottoman mosques, right? They're very, very on, on brand, we say, yeah? They're very on brand, the Ottoman mosques. So if you go to the Balkans, you mentioned the Balkans. If you go to the Balkans, you can clearly see that there's the Ottoman inspired mosques, right? And some of course still standing from the Ottoman period, the mosques there, the madrasas, etc. all of that, they're still there. If you go to Tokyo, all right? Anyone been to Tokyo? No? Okay. So if you go to Tokyo, there's Tokyo Jami, and it's actually an Ottoman mosque in Tokyo. But there's also a Tokyo mosque using the architecture of Japan. So there's also that element. If you go, so Sudan, for example, your mosques in Sudan, are your mosques in Sudan the same as the mosques in Turkey? No, they're different, okay? Are uh, the mosques in, uh, of course, in Yemen, the mosques in Yemen, are they the same as the, the mosques in, let's say, in France? No, they're not, okay? The mosques in France, what are they inspired by, actually? The main mosque in France, the, in Paris. Has, there, has everyone been to Paris? Wow. Uh, um, okay, let's stop giving examples about where you've been. <laughs> uh, okay, the MENA region, okay. Has anyone been to Cairo? Cairo? Okay. Uh, what is, can, you, can you tell the difference between the mosque in Cairo and the mosques in uh, Rabat? Has anyone been to Morocco? Wow, alhamdulillah, you saved us, okay. <laughs> All right, now the, the key question is now, is have you been to Cairo? No. No, <laughs> okay. All right, where have you been? In Paris. You've been to Paris? Yeah. Okay, have you been to the mosque in Paris? No, I didn't see Egypt. Okay, well, okay, what other country in the MENA region have you been to? Some, uh, only okay, so, fine. Yeah. So the mosques in Turkey and the mosques in, uh, in Morocco, mm -hmm. are they the same? No, no, they're different. Okay. How, how different are they in Morocco? We have one, one, uh, yeah, one minaret, but here you can see that there are four or six. Okay, and if you go to the south of Spain, mm -hmm. yeah, who's been to the south of Spain? Mm -hmm. No one. <laughs> so if you... Okay, mm -hmm. the south of Spain, if you go to the south of Spain, there are some places which are not mosques, are not places of worship, but they have the minara because before it used to be a mosque, right? So that's the architecture of what the Moroccan, North African tradition, because I think also in Algeria as well, it's quite similar in these minaras. They have them there. Now, if you look at the Turkish minaret and if you place it in Morocco, you know instantly it's a Turkish minaret, right? Exactly. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because the idea behind the Ramadan pavilion that we built was the idea is that we wanted to take inspiration from different regions around the globe. Okay, because they inspired the diaspora of the Muslim community in Britain. Now, we built this and we put it in the V&A for two months to celebrate, obviously, Ramadan. Now, you would ask yourself, okay, this is thinking about a creative uh, idea and solution. Really thinking outside of the box. How can we be very creative 
in bridge building and thinking of an idea that actually we want to make sure that people are coming together and uh, thinking about Ramadan in a through art, for example. You know, has anyone thought about Ramadan through art, for example, before? Decorations, Decorations exactly, but like from a from an Islamic heritage perspective, you know, like this is also really powerful. Um, because we are in Turkey, for example, I'm sure you have probably had experienced Ramadan in Turkey. What is special in Ramadan in Turkey? Give me some things that are special in Turkey in Ramadan. Uh, what? Pide? No, Ramadan pide. Pide I can have now. No, no, Ramadan pide. Oh, Ramadan pide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? It's different? Better than pasta, I know. So next. What's next? Anything else? Group of thought. Okay, but it's only unique to Turkey, remember? Yeah, yeah. And they have different messages. Yeah. What else is very special to Turkey in Ramadan? In Tarawih? What is Ferrari? Ferrari Tarawih? Ferrari Tarawih is special in Turkey. Yeah. Okay. All right, something positive, please. You know, let's put okay, the, the Vicar? Vicar and Tarawih, also Ferrari or Lamborghini? Or, okay, next. Yeah, what else? Something connected to food. What's also another food thing that's only happened? Yeah, what else? Gulash, someone said gulash? Yeah, okay, only in Ramadan. Nowhere, no, 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 nothing during the year. Okay, this is also, for example, powerful to talk about the foods of Ramadan in Turkey, for example. This is a creative way. So I'm just giving you an example in terms of like raising awareness about the month of Ramadan with people who are not Muslim. They're really interested. So you can say, well, actually, you know what? There are the foods of Ramadan in Turkey. These foods are only had in Ramadan in Turkey, for example. Maybe there's something similar. I know in Morocco, actually, I went to Morocco. I know in Morocco, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. On Friday, it is couscous. Yeah. That's it. During the whole week, they don't do couscous, only on Friday. Everyone does couscous on Friday. Yeah. To, to share, yeah. So couscous is on Friday. If you want to eat tagine on Friday, they will look at you and be like, excuse me, we are closed. There's no tagine on Friday, it's only couscous, okay? So this is really interesting, okay? So how can we think of creative ways? We already mentioned technology, food, sport, architecture, art. These are creative ways we can actually uh, think about connecting with different cultures from around the world. And if you want to disseminate that information, where is the best place to disseminate it? Social media, exactly. For if you're targeting the youth, all right? So it depends, who am I targeting? What social um, network will I be using, for example? And then in what language? When I mean language, not only the, the verbal language, but linguistically, but also what tools I'll be using to reach out to this audience. And also, what is the creative idea? What am I using, right? So these are some of the elements that I wanted to share with you guys, inshallah. Like, um, this is obviously the practical element for, for, from this uh, uh, section. But I think overall, uh, you're doing all of this by remembering, again, some of the heavy topics which, which we started off with and now you're left like this, okay? We wanna bring you back up again to say like, uh, we all go through this process of trying to understand uh, a, a meaning uh, to our lives, right? And you're not alone, by the way. Honestly, you're not alone. Like, there, this is something which we all face, but I just want you all to um, be more strict on yourself from uh, accepting everything. Even me now, for example, go away and leave and be like, question everything that I just said. He said this, this, and this. I don't agree with him. Yeah, I agree with him. Maybe he question everything. Be critical. Because it's only through our critical thinking that we can actually be aware of actually, okay, what is my relationship with Allah? Why am I saying submission? What does submission mean, for example? You know? And I'd like to finish on this last point, is um, the biggest evil in this world is arrogance. The biggest evil in this world is arrogance. If shaitan prostrated to Adam, 
Maybe we wouldn't be here. That's it. Arrogance. Because you created me from fire and you created him from clay, you want me to prostrate to Adam? No, I'm not going to do that. And this is just like the one thing that happened, which really became the domino effect to where we are today. You know? And this is the idea of submitting. When we say obey, someone mentioned obey, obedience. Obedience and to actually submit is to remove ourselves from arrogance. And I think the last, the second point of that question that you mentioned um, was on the liberation of the self. That's it. The liberation of the self. And this is how we liberate ourselves from our, from our nafs, from ourself. Is going back and thinking and remembering that when we are genuinely accepting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the controller of all affairs and we remove ourselves from the sense of arrogance and the ego. We all have egos. I have ego. Everyone has ego. Don't say I don't have ego. If you, if you say I don't have ego, you have ego. Okay? That's your ego talking. <laughs> Saying I don't have ego. I don't have ego. That's fine. No, you do have ego. Everyone has ego. But it's how to tame it. Some days it's like this. Some days it's like this. And what are the best ways to combat ego? You humble yourself. How do you humble yourself? Some of the most amazing uh, shuyukh of our time and in the past, you know what they used to do? They used to go to mosques and clean the toilet. Yeah. They used to go to mosques and clean the toilet. Right? Some, some, guys, some CEOs that I know today, they go and they tell me stories that they spend hours in the kitchen cleaning the dishes from evening to morning. They don't need to do it, but they do it as a practice to humble themselves, to remind themselves. This is so important. Because the moment you say, Anna this, me this, I, I this, I this, I this, where have we gone? We have now gone into the sense of individualism. But if you go in the sense of anonymity, anonymity is the liberation of the self. Anonymity is the liberation of the self. Because like we saw the example of Mimar Sinan, how he used to sign off his work, this is a master in architecture. But how did he convey his message to the world? His pieces, his artwork, that's it. Because why? It's all done for what? As a submission to God, for the fi sabil Allah. This is the most important thing. So not only do we need to make sure that we, we you might have a, a creative idea, a wonderful idea to solve the situation, solve a problem, but if your heart is not aligned in the right place, this is going to be a problem. This will create maybe a bigger problem. Maybe you will create a solution in the short term, or in the long term, it creates a bigger problem. You create more fitna, for example, etc., etc. That's why it's important that whatever we do, we are doing something which does what? Empowers the community that we're with. And I'll just leave on this final quote, which a friend of mine shared. He said that every great leader is defined by planting a seed, knowing that they do not have a place in the shade. Let me say that again. A great leader is someone who plants the seed knowing that they do not have a place in the shade. Uh, thank you, Amar, for your wisdom. You made us much wiser today. Thank you for that. I hope so. <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully we have a bit, a bit tired. We have, we have passed after as well. Uh, we we uh, stretched the time, but if you guys have any questions, we have five minutes. We can be quick. So, uh, anybody has any question? Please. Since 2013, 
My brother, every single day, he makes the fee for 500 euros. 500, 500, 500, 300 or 200 children every morning by himself. And my father is 67 years old. So it's kind of hard. But now I understand what he did. So thank you. Thank you so much. And this is uh, our, our elders. Honestly, I, I, f I really fear the... See, my generation is probably in between the first generation and the younger generation, the youth. I'm in the middle, I think. The problem is the, there are very few of us in, in my generation who acknowledge and respect our elders. Like, in the sense that we sit and, we sit and have time with them. You know, we, we want to spend time with them and take knowledge from them. My fear is the younger generation is, doesn't have that relationship. They almost are like, no, you're just old. You're on Facebook. That's old. You know? <laughs> like, and this is the biggest worry I have. Because their time is now limited, subhanAllah. We don't know when our time is up. But I highly encourage. It could be any person, by the way. It doesn't have to be a family relative. But just sit with them and listen to them. Listen to their stories. Because a lot of the, f the life experiences we're, f we're facing, they have been through it and maybe even more. You know? And this is worth more than 10 degrees from Harvard, honestly. The life experiences of our elders, what they've been through. Because why? It goes back to what? Hikmah. The hikmah that Allah has blessed them with is so powerful, so important. So... Um, if there's anything good that we learn from today, inshallah, then remember that this is not from, from me or from anyone else, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So um, do not also like glorify what the, what the person is saying, because all this stuff anyway has been said <laughs> centuries ago. Okay? This is nothing new or transformative, but we also need a more reminder from time to time. We're forgetful. Insan comes from the word of, you know, yeah. So if we're forgetful. This is normal. But just always remember that here, all of you, by the way, remind each other and support each other because it's difficult. It's not easy. Of course it's difficult. We, we, we skip the difficult part, by the way. I didn't want to frame the difficulties that we're facing because you know everyone's going through difficulties. It's a really tough time, really, really tough. But was it as tough or worse than what our forefathers and foremothers had to go through? You know? So it's all a matter of perspective. Really, really important. Any other questions, guys, or comments, anything? Okay, um, I guess uh, we end here. Thank you all for coming. Um, we know we stretched the time and it's a bit late for you guys. Apologies, by the way, I, I'm sorry for that. No, uh, we, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can forgive me. And, uh, but I, I enjoyed my time with you guys, that's why. And I really appreciate the fact that you're coming out on a weekday, it's late. Um, uh, because it shows commitment, mashallah, and I really appreciate you guys uh, being here. And uh, I hope you have taken some wisdom, we can say, and then try it's, and implement it in our lives. But because I have, so, uh, my passion is the youth, so this is why you know it's really, really important. No, no, I, we have high hopes that it's all well received, mashallah. These guys, they just like you mentioned, they took the time and they came, even though it's late. Uh, we also extend our thanks to you on behalf of Shah. Thank you for giving us the time, sharing your wisdom. And uh, I believe personally, uh, the people who don't share the wisdom, just like his dad and you, they left nothing in this world. They just came and left for nothing. And that's part of the purpose. Mm. To share. So I would like to say thank you again. I like this, mashallah. Don't come and leave with nothing. <laughs> come and leave something leave something behind for someone else don't come live and then you know like it's getting on a free bus <laughs> basically <laughs> okay guys again thank you very much uh, we end it here uh, thank you everyone attended whether on zoom virtually or here and uh, hope to see you again in the upcoming next job events inshallah, inshallah.